Thank you very much, Dr. Wirth, and uh, it's good to see everybody in the postprandial condition after lunch. Um, special thanks to Carmen for the invitation here. Uh, phenomenal meeting so far and looking into the future tomorrow. And a little special call out. I see the young blood up here, Carmen, which is a good thing for the field. Um, so very exciting to see uh, folks who are going to move this field forward. So as Dr. Worth said, I'm going to tell you a little bit about circulatory dysfunction during exercise in ME. I'll hasten to add uh, what I say about ME, we have recently found to apply to long COVID as well. Um, they look very similar, if not identical, in our exercise world. So here's a table of contents for the next 10 minutes or so. I'd like to tell you about our major vehicle for investigating circulatory dysfunction, which is the so-called invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test. Uh, everybody in the room probably knows about cardiopulmonary exercise testing. We do it on a cycle ergometer. It's incremental. It's a, about five or six minute test. Patients, generally speaking, do not get PEM with our test. It's very quick and the intense portion is only at the top. The invasive portion, as I'll, you will see in just a second, appears to be critical, at least with current biomarkers, to better understand what's going on in the inside of the organism. Without it, uh, we can't have a full understanding. So it complements our uh, deep dive into the pathophysiology during exercise. Um, so I'll begin with invasive cardiopulmonary exercise testing and a little another call out here. This is to our predecessors at Harvard. Uh, who knew they would think about fatigue 100 years ago? Uh, unfortunately, there was no ME, there was no long COVID, obviously, uh, that was recognized. Uh, they were studying the workers of the world to make them more productive. So they put some of the tenets of exercise physiology and the human on uh, the map. Uh, so here's all of exercise, uh, kind of in a Carl Wasserman type slide. Uh, what we can see is muscle metabolism out here. Rob Voost is going to tell you more about the mitochondria and the talk that follows here. In response to human volitional exercise, incremental exercise, the metabolism can rise many fold, 50 fold or more. Uh, and if everything, if homeostasis is to be maintained out here in the periphery and this machine, machinery is going to work, you have to have uh, convective and diffusive flow of oxygen. Uh, into the mitochondria, and, and you need to remove waste products uh, away from the exercising muscle. Out it goes with diffusive and convective steps, and here's the interface with the environment. So I think everybody knows what exercise is, but all this machinery has to be working and well integrated if the individual is to not suffer from exertional intolerance. So uh, here is what we do in the basement of my hospital 14 times a week. Um, this test was originally developed to identify early heart disease and pulmonary hypertension, but over the past almost a decade, we have found it exceedingly useful in determining what might ail a patient during exercise, especially in the upright position uh, with ME and then subsequently long COVID. So in this gentleman's neck is a pulmonary artery catheter. It's placed by Dr. Waxman, whom one of you knows, um, interventional cardiologist, pulmonologist, around the corner from the exercise lab and a radial artery catheter in his left wrist. And from these things, uh, these catheters, we can really do this deep dive into the pathophysiology. So this is, this is non-invasive um, up here. Uh, I, don't, I want to use the, oh, there it is. So non-invasive variables up here. Uh, I'll get it in a second here, here we go. Uh, are measured at the mouthpiece, and there's the time-honored uh, VO2 peak. I'm not on a timer, I hope. I'll leave the pointer alone. Uh, minute ventilation, the O2 uptake at the mouth, the CO2 output. And then uh, out here, uh, we show to the right uh, mean arterial pressures, uh, biomarkers in arterial blood, but very important is the arterial oxygen content in arterial blood coming from the radial artery catheter every minute. Uh, equally important, as you'll see in a second, in ME and long COVID is a measure of oxygen uptake and extraction, its use in the periphery, and that's reflected by the ability to depress the mixed venous oxygen content. That's at the tip of this yellow catheter, which resides in the pulmonary artery. And then we've got filling pressures. 
on the left side of the heart. This is the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And we got the filling pressure on the right side of the heart, the right atrial pressure. You'll see that these two pressures are exceedingly important and the ability to extract oxygen is exceedingly important in describing the pathophysiology during acute exercise. Um, special nod here to a German-born uh, physiologist uh, who is Adolf Fick, who put on the map something that we use every day with this type of testing. It's the Fick principle that dictates the VO2 is related to the cardiac output and the difference between arterial and mixed venous oxygen content. And if you rearrange this, we're measuring this at the mouthpiece continuously, this every minute, this every minute. We have a Fick cardiac output every minute. I will hasten to add, this is pulmonary blood flow. This is what is measured going through the lung. And if there's no shunting of blood anywhere, it's equal to the systemic blood flow. But I'm gonna show you in a minute that may not be so in ME and long COVID. All right, here's a, a simplified algorithm for our testing. I'm gonna emphasize two things. Uh, up here is a degree, the measurement of degree of impairment, the time-honored VO2 max at the M end of an incremental cycling test. And one can rapidly determine that the lungs are not the culprit with this measurement. I'm not going to talk about that. The rest of the world is explained by that FIC principle that I just introduced you to. Uh, if the pump is the major problem, we flow down here. We can express the cardiac output at peak exercise as a percent predicted. And if it is down and there's no left heart disease and no right heart disease, we may end up in this bucket uh, which I'll cut to the chase, is ubiquitous in ME and long COVID. We call it preload failure or insufficiency, and it's manifested by low filling pressures, be getting a low cardiac output, be getting a low VO2 peak. Over here is the other side of the exercise universe. It's on the arterial side. This is reflecting what's going on out in the periphery. This is um, arteriolar. It's microcirculatory, and it's uh, limb, skeletal, muscle, mitochondrial function. Uh, so we're going to come back to that in a minute here. So let me show you how we got into this business of preload failure. Uh, it began almost a decade ago. Will Oldham was the first author <clears throat> on this paper. And to describe in English what we did, we had an invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test of about 800 patients. Uh, we ruled out everything heart and lung related and there was a subset of patients left over with exertional intolerance sick enough to come to our lab and get a catheter in their neck, and uh, they didn't have heart or lung disease, and we asked, okay, what's going on there? And the answer was um, largely preload insufficiency, and this is what we saw. What differentiated this group of undifferentiated exercise intolerance uh, was filling pressures too low in the upright position especially at maximum exercise, not as much of a signal at rest. So here's the right atrial pressure, a surrogate for the left atrial pressure, and you can see this is what differentiates these patients without heart or lung disease uh, from normals. Uh, we did a crude regressions uh, against time-honored VO2 max, and the lower the filling pressures were on both sides of the heart, the worse the VO2 max, and the mechanism uh, for it was largely, we thought at the time, cardiac output. So we call this preload insufficiency. We learned the hard way after the fact that most of these patients met IOM criteria for MECFS. So that's how the lung doctor got into this business back in the day. So this is where they landed in our bucket. Uh, preload failure, this is modestly decreased. This was the problem, and the reason for the problem was right here. So we call this preload insufficiency. We took a little deeper dive into this three years ago with the help of Philip Joseph, whom I'll show you here, now at Yale. Uh, and we asked uh, similar questions with an expanded database. We had about 1,500 patients in this study in a very similar fashion to the paper I just presented. Uh, no heart or lung disease, exertional intolerance, VO2 peak usually modestly depressed, and we knew they all met criteria for MECFS. And we asked, a uh, couple of other questions. Is this the only hemodynamic abnormality of the preload failure, uh, or is there something else? So that was one. And the other was we were increasingly recognizing there was an entity called small fiber neuropathy, which many of you know about in the audience. 
that was associated with these disorders. And we uh, systematically looked with skin biopsies for this entity. And I'll tell you a little more about that in a second. So um, we borrowed from the POTS literature where they have described low flow states and high flow states during an upright tilt table test. And we stole that idea and applied it to the exercise physiology. So here's a low flow patient uh, whose major mechanism for decreased VO2 peak by the FIC principle is cardiac output. That's the paper I just showed you. Uh, but additionally, we identified a cadre of patients with high pulmonary blood flow. Remember, that's what we're measuring with the pulmonary artery catheter. And the major mechanism for their decreased VO2 peak is impaired systemic oxygen extraction, failure to take up and utilize oxygen in the periphery. We've done a recent update of this, and I'm going to present this with colleagues at American Thoracic Society in San Francisco next week. I'll just flash through this quickly, but it's a very similar story to what I just gave you. Uh, expanded database, 335 patients with ME, 72 with long COVID, um, expanded normal database. And it's really the same story as what I just showed you. Uh, there is a very similar uh, reduction in VO2 peak. Remember, it's not always massively depressed. Uh, here's some outliers, an up, up position. Uh, the VO2 peak is decreased because the cardiac output is decreased in part. Uh, the reason the cardiac output is decreased is low filling pressures shown here on the right side of the heart compared to normals. And then additionally, there is this subset of patients with impaired oxygen extraction. So it's a double whammy by the FIC principle, low cardiac outputs due to low filling pressures and poor systemic oxygen extraction. So here's the small fiber neuropathy story. Many in the audience may know this exists. These fibers have been known forever to be unmyelinated. Uh, they are all over the body. They mediate pain. Uh, fibromyalgia is mediated by this entity. It's thought at least in 40, 45% of the time. What's more recently recognized is that they also play a major role in autonomic function and blood vessel tone and their blood flow, therefore blood flow during exercise. So when they're deficient or dysfunctional, they're deficient by a skin biopsy, but the remaining ones may dysfunctional. They may be associated with uh, dysautonomia, POTS included, and I'll show you our data. So the 407 patients with ME and long COVID were about to present we have a two-thirds prevalence of small fiber neuropathy if you do two biopsies, including one deeper one up by the hip that gets sweat glands. A phenomenally high prevalence, and we're inclined to think uh, this is relevant to exercise intolerance in our patients. So this is where this additional group ended up. Uh, our initial thought was that this is all peripheral left to right shunting, and then we did some studies, and Rob Voost is about to tell you about his studies, that additionally add to this differential diagnosis of impaired oxygen extraction, intrinsic limb, skeletal muscle, mitochondrial dysfunction. So if you shunt left to right, meaning blood flow goes out the aorta, it's well oxygenated, but it does not get properly to the muscle mitochondria, and even more specifically, uh, slow twitch fibers, uh, you will see this phenomenon that is a de facto shunt. There could be a diffusion abnormality for oxygen as well in patients. Rob's work will uh, attest to that. Uh, and then intrinsic problems with the mitochondria and maybe in the differential. Super quickly, I'll give you um, a randomized clinical trial that we did a couple of years ago. Patients came in with ME, known ME. We identified the preload failure during an initial clinical test. And then they received a single dose of pyridostigmine or mestinon. I'm going to tell you more about that tomorrow as part of our clinical trial, or placebo. And then we asked them to pedal again 45 minutes later with the catheters in place. And if they received drug, their VO2 peak on the second pedaling was better. If they didn't, it actually was worse. This might be the beginnings of PEM very early. And the reason the VO2 peak was higher was that the cardiac output was higher. And the reason the cardiac output was higher was increased filling pressures. So we think all of this in the aggregate, uh, it, because we know this mestinon, pyridostigmine, is a neuroactive drug. It's FDA approved for myasthenia gravis. But it increases acetylcholine and the sympathetic ganglion in the neural synapse, which is 
cholinergically mediated. And the efferent fiber is sympathetic and amongst other things regulates blood vessel tone. So we think mestinon or pyridostigmine may work through this mechanism in ME and long COVID. Uh, and I think that leads to my final conclusion here. And that is in ME, CFS and parenthetically long COVID, we have evidence of systemic vascular dysregulation. Some of it is preload failure, that's failure to venoconstrict and prime the pump. Some of it is peripheral left to right shunting. Uh, I would add mitochondrial dysfunction and friends. There is a high prevalence of small fiber neuropathy. We're inclined to think the two are related. Uh, some of this corrects with a neuroactive drug, so we'd conclude uh, some of the circulatory abnormalities during acute exercise are related to neurovascular dysregulation. So that's all I've got for you. Thank you, you got a lovely city, and I appreciate it. Thank you, David, for showing this interesting data that helped to understand exercise intolerance. So there's time for one question. So, yeah. In uh, some of the patients in MECFS have been shown to have the Warburg effect, in which the uh, the, the energy production is not in the mitochondria. So rather than damaged mitochondria, could it be that they have the Warburg effect and, and so the oxygen is not getting used there? So uh, absolutely a possibility. Um, the, I think you're going to hear two great talks, one that immediately follows. They'll all be great. But then in, in addition to that, um, from Carl, our Norwegian colleague, who's going to actually uh, exactly talk about those things, but the answer is a definitive yes, and I'm going to defer to my colleagues uh, to further explain. Okay, one short question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your fantastic talk. Um, I was wondering how much mestinone did your patients receive sure. in, in this so, trial? Um, if you're here tomorrow, I'm going to present our clinical trial, and I will give you our paradigm, but um, it's uh, in the, the randomized clinical trial I described, it was 60 milligrams by mouth, six zero. Uh, we usually start patients practically at 30 for three times a day for two weeks, and then we graduate to 60 three times a day. But more on treatment tomorrow. And was that also applied in, in healthy controls? Uh, no, there were no healthy controls. Um, IRB, our IRB will not allow us to put these catheters into normal humans. Um, I am aware of other places that are able to do that. So, uh, no, this was placebo controlled. So they all had ME placebo controlled. Thanks. Thank you. Okay.